Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. This is the fifth lecture in our Baroque for Breakfast lecture series, and I'm going to be talking today about Vivaldi and uh, the Ospedale della Pietà. Now I'll just uh, share my screen and we can get started. So as I mentioned, I'll be talking about Vivaldi and the Ospedale della Pietà today. Um, I became interested in this topic maybe about five years ago or so. Um, as some of you know, I'm a bassoonist and um, I realized, I learned that uh, Vivaldi wrote 39 bassoon concertos while he was working at the Pietà. And I've always wondered if he was writing those for the women that were playing there. And uh, unfortunately, there isn't any real evidence that he either was or wasn't. Um, he dedicated a few of these concertos to um, a professional bassoonist who was working in a court orchestra, so possibly he wrote them for him. But we do know that there were bassoons bought at the Pietà and there were women playing the bassoon. So I can only imagine that they were probably playing these concertos as well as the other 500 or so concertos that he wrote for various instruments. So this painting um, on the screen right now was is from 1729 by Antonio Stom. And right in the very middle of the screen where my pointer is, that uh, largest pink building, is the Pietà, um, how it appeared in 1729. It's right on the one of the main canals of Venice. And you can maybe get an idea from the painting as to all the hustle and bustle that was going on there and just the setting of the Pietà. I'd like to start out by just talking about some of the key researchers. Um, a lot has changed in the recent past with the research um, in this topic. Um, one of the early researchers was Michael Talbot. He's written a great book just entitled Vivaldi and a number of other books and, uh, and many papers on the subject. He started uh, researching this in the 1970s-ish. And similarly, Eleanor Selfridge Field, um, she started her work around the 80s and has written a lot about this topic. Um, one person I've become quite interested in is Mickey White, who's a British researcher who moved to Venice and uh, spending 100% of her time researching the Pietà and Vivaldi. She started doing that in uh, the early 2000s. Um, and uh, she's just plowing her way through all the archives at the uh, State Archives of Venice. And um, in the State Archives, there are 78 kilometers of shelving storage documents. Um, and uh, there's about a thousand volumes of um, documents related specifically to the Pietà. There's a picture of her um, in the top right, just sort of walking through these massive quantities of documents. And in the bottom left, she's opening one of the uh, busta or files about the Pietà. And uh, you can see how f fat that is. Um, she's just systematically going through these. She'll never be able to make it through all two th or 1,000 of them, I expect. But she's learning an awful lot about how life was in the Pietà. And she's uh, in uh, 2018, she published this book here called Antonio Vivaldi, A Life in Documents which has a lot of the information in it. And if you're really interested, you might want to take a look at that book. Um, all the documents, of course, are in Italian, but she does comment on them in English. So there were four ospedali in uh, Venice at the time. They were typically called the Ospedali Grandi. There was the Mendicanti for the poor and the war wounded the derelitti for the homeless, the incurabile for those with incurable diseases, and the Pietà, which was the oldest of the four, and it was established in 1346 for abandoned and unwanted babies. And uh, these hospitality were intended as a charitable service. They were run and, and funded by governors who were wealthy noblemen fulfilling their duties to the Republic. Um, 
there was a bit of wanting to get the poor and homeless people and people with diseases off the street. So if they were people were um, in those categories, they were expected to go to one of these places, which they did. Um, at least they were provided with food and shelter and an education in these places, sort of in hopes that they would re-enter uh, Venice as productive citizens. Uh, all of the ospedali gave basic education and a, a bit of a music education, but it was certainly not um, the prime uh, feature of them. Uh, the women in particular were taught music because it was, it was felt that it would make them more suitable to be married or to go into a convent if they knew something about music. Um, here's a picture of the original Pietà that is still standing today. It's a tiny little house and uh, it was established by a Franciscan monk in 1346 and he had 10 babies in there originally um, that he was looking after. So the, as I mentioned, the Pietà was founded in 1346 and by Pietro D'Assisi, a Franciscan monk. And uh, just to clarify a few things, because you read a lot on the internet about this topic and and people say things that are not particularly 100% correct. It was not a school just for girls. It was not a musical academy. It was not an orphanage. These babies did have parents. Um, and it was not a convent. It was somewhat modeled on... Um, the principles of a convent and the way that they they ran it, but it was not a convent. It was an institution for abandoned and unwanted children. And in the sense of the word ospedale, which means hospital in Italian, it, it really means hospice um, in English. So just a little bit about um, Venice in the time of Vivaldi. Um, in the 17th and 18th century, uh, Venice was in decline geopolitically, but it was still an art and music mecca. And uh, wealthy tourists, particularly men, would come to Venice and while they were doing their grand tour of the continent, um, they would often come at carnival time. And um, um, in Venice at the time, it was a very liberal place. There were a lot of courtesans, prostitutes, and these men would come from other European places and to enjoy this sort of strange combination of high culture, high art, and, and sex. Um, there's, a, and there's a picture here of Pietro Longhi's The Ridotto, which is a, a casino, and they're in there and they're masked, they're wearing their carnival masks. And uh, so, you know, they would uh, wear the masks and they would uh, participate in, in uh, the casino and all of these festivities uh, um, and make use of the courtesans, which were very prominent. And this uh, sort of sex industry had a, some un, uh, you know unfortunate consequences. There was a relentless flood of unwanted babies, um, and many of whom were deformed by syphilis. Um, at the time, we're talking about the uh, Pietà would get about four babies per day, and they were delivered by the mothers usually, or sometimes a nobleman, and. There are horrible stories about, you know, um, priests, etc., finding babies floating in the canal and they would bring them there. And so just some, some terrible stories that you can read about. So um, a bit about the life in the Pietà. Um, like I said, it not, was not just girls. Both boys and girls were, um, babies were deposited there. The babies were placed in a scaffetta, which was a hole in the wall, a hole in the brick wall. And uh, if the baby was 
too big to fit in the hole, then they couldn't uh, leave, leave the baby there. They had to take them away. Um, no questions were asked. They couldn't be prosecuted for any crimes. Um, like I said, most of these babies were born through prostitution or illegitimate uh, children of the noblemen. Uh, very detailed records were kept. Um, the uh, babies were initially placed in foster homes. A lot of them were in the country. The Pieta had a lot of country property and homes where they uh, farmed and provided all the, uh, a lot of the food um, for the organization. So the babies were placed with wet nurses in these foster homes or either in the countryside or in Venice. And they came back to the Pieta at about the age of six. The boys learned a trade, um, they, such as uh, shoemaking, uh, stone cutting, uh, weaving, and they were essentially kicked out at the age of 16 to go uh, apply their trade. The girls had three options. Um, after they were given education for 10 years and after that they had the option to marry, to become nuns, or to stay at the Pieta for the rest of their lives which most of them did. And um, it was a severely cloistered existence. They weren't allowed out. They weren't, they weren't allowed out without permission. They weren't allowed to have visitors. Um, that, um, and they were severely punished for if they tried to do some of these things. So it was not all, it was not the, the best existence, but at least they were safe and they were getting room and board and reasonably well looked after. When the uh, mother dropped off the baby, she would often leave some kind of a token. And in the bottom right here, um, you can see a, a wind rose, which was sort of like a precursor to a compass. And this was a wind rose um, painted on some parchment. And the mother had cut it in half and she would leave half, half of it with the baby and take half of it away. And they used things like playing cards or pieces of cloth or all sorts of things that they would cut in half and leave half of the baby and take the other half away and they were allowed to come back at any time and match up their their token with the baby and take their baby back if they wanted to. And in the uh, Pietà Museum in Venice they have drawers of these half tokens that were obviously never claimed. Um, so the women at the Pietà, there were essentially two groups of women. The Fili di Commune, they were the non-musicians, and they received a general education and they learned skills such as sewing, laundering, embroidering, weaving, which were um, ostensibly to prepare them for a life, um, for marriage or for a life in the convent. And uh, they took care of various tasks in the institution, um, administrative tasks, all sorts of other tasks. And they sold the, the works that they produced by weaving, embroidery, etc., um, which helped to uh, offset costs for living there. Um, the other group of women was the Fili di Coro, who were the musicians. And they received uh, extensive musical education. Um, at about 10 years of age, all the women um, in the Pieta were assessed for musical ability and about one in 10 of them were considered to be fit to join the Fili de Coro. Um, and they wore a uniform of sorts at the Pieta, it was a red dress as shown in that picture. The other ospedali, they had different colors. So the Figli di Coro, they were considered, they would have been considered the elite of the Pietà. In Vivaldi's time, there were about 60 or 70 women in the Coro, and they earned a living there within the institution. So they were actually were paid for being musicians, and um, some of them had multiple jobs in sort of in the medical field, um, as nurses or pharmacists or, um, doing um, work, administrative work as, as well as being musicians. And as they were the elite, they had their own separate rooms and apartments and were given a special diet. 
and there are records that show um, there was a certain uh, pecking pecking order when it came to meals. The the figli di coro were allowed to go first and have as much as they wanted, and then the rest of the women and then the the boys were were last in the feeding schedule. Uh, most of these women spent their whole lives at the Pieta. Not many of them left to get married or become nuns. And uh, later on, they started to allow um, some of the fili de coro to teach what was known as the fili in educazioni, which was the daughters of rich noblemen were allowed to come there and uh, take lessons from some of the members. Um, and the very best uh, singers and instrumentalists were allowed to leave the Pieta and work elsewhere in Europe and they were supposed to promote um, the orchestra and choir at the Pieta and get more tourists to come and spend their money. So who were they? Uh, this is uh, some uh, tables that Richard Vendome put together in 2020 based on the work of Mickey White um, going through all of these volumes of documents. And this um, is a list of all the members of the uh, Coro in 1718, the one year. You can see there this came from Busta 348, so volume 348 of one of these documents. And I don't expect you to read all of this, but just generally the numbers in brackets are the ages of the women. So they were not young women. The average age was 40 um, in, in the Coro. And you can see here, um, some of them had different duties like this uh, Bastiana was a chemist, Anzoletta was also a seamstress. Um, and some of, many of them actually were, um, specified soloists in some of the works that Vivaldi wrote. For example, here, uh, Sylvia was the soprano, one of the soprano soloists in Judith at Triumphant. So he wrote these pieces specifically for specific women. Um, and here's another one, uh, Lucietta. She, uh, he wrote the Sonata RV779 for her. And you can also see here that many of these women played a number of different instruments as well as singing. This is the second sheet of this. Again, the, this sort of goes down and goes down in ages. Um, the average age was around 40. So here's Phoebe Barber, another soloist. Um, Gail Truda, uh, Vivaldi wrote a lot of pieces specifically for her. She must have been a good contralto. Um, here's uh, Fili Anna, who was a, a bass singer, and that's a very important one to look at. We'll talk about that some more later on. And the third page, again, uh, slightly younger ones, uh, down to 15, 16 year olds and one who was 11 years of age. And uh, you see a few tenor singers in here. Uh, we'll be talking about that. We do know there were tenor and bass singers that were singing in the choir. So the figli de coro, the babies that were dropped off at the Pieta, they had no surnames. Um, so they were known by the names of the instruments they played. And this is just another list uh, that Mickey White has prepared from the archives of some of the women. And so you can see here that you have Lucietta Organista, Paulina del Tenor, and on. and it's just the name of the instrument or the name of the singing part that they sang. A couple of tenors here, another a basso, Aneta del Basso. So this is how they were known um, by the instrument they played or the part they sang. And later on, you'll see that some of the women um, did have a surname and those were, that was later on after they started uh, admitting uh, the daughters of some of the noble families. So a little bit about Vivaldi. He was um, 
came into the Pieta sort of at the time when they were really um, expanding the music um, programs. And he was born in Venice, 1678, and he was the son of uh, Giovanni Vivaldi, who was a professional violinist. And he learned violin from his father, and they traveled around and played, and he became a, quite a virtuoso. virtuoso. Um, we really know him today but as a composer, but he was um, an incredibly talented violinist as well. He began studying um, for the priesthood at age 15, and then he did that for 10 years, and then he entered the priesthood officially in 1703. He was 25, and then that same year he was hired at the Pietà as Maestro di Violino. So he was the violin teacher, and uh, he was at the Pietà on and off for 38 years following that. Um, in 1716, he was promoted to the Maestro di Concerti, so the master of the concerts, and he was responsible for both the choir and the orchestra. His duties were teaching music, conducting choirs and instrumental ensembles, buying the instruments, and of course, writing music. Um, this is just one example of uh, some of the detailed records that they kept. Um, this was a record of Vivaldi's first payment as Maestro di Violino in 1704, and he was paid 60 duc ducats a year, which was about four times as much as what his father was making as a violinist at St. Mark's. So he was paid reasonably well. And this is just an example of some of the records. They have uh, records of everything that went on, every payment that was made, uh, records of the governor's meetings, their discussions about who to hire, who to fire, um, everything that was purchased, including the, all of the instruments. Um, you can see that Vivaldi in some of these records, you can see that Vivaldi was buying better violins for some of the better players, etc. So it's it's really quite amazing that we have these detailed records. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the performances. Um, originally, they they only performed religious services, but later on, um, the governors realized that. They could make a significant profit um, from performances and, and they started to increase the number of musicians um, at the Pietà and they were buying instruments and getting Vivaldi to write a lot of music and uh, so that they could perform shows for visiting dignitaries and eventually public shows and private shows in houses of noblemen or not houses of noblemen, but four noblemen. Um, there's a picture here um, from Gravenbrook's Book of Venetian Costumes showing the balcony of the church where the, um, in the, the Pietà's church where the women performed. And you can see here that uh, they're up here in the balcony and they're performing behind a metal screen, sort of a grill. And uh, they play, they perform this way all the time, um, ostensibly to preserve their modesty, and um, so that these uh, visiting men on their European tour weren't able to gawk at them, so to speak. <laughs> and um, as I mentioned, uh, I think I mentioned, uh, a lot of them were disfigured because uh, of syphilis that the father had. So, um, you know, that was possibly another reason for them to be behind the screen. And they had a, a very extensive repertoire, concertos, symphonias, sonatas, chamber music, and even oratorios. Here's another photograph of a concert um, that was put on for visiting Russian noblemen. And, well, not noblemen, just noble people. There's women there as well. And uh, you can see up in the, on the left side, there's three rows um, in the balcony, and these are the women performing. Um, and in the top are the singers, in the middle are the violinists, and in the bottom row are the, um, the lower strings. And so again, they were put up there and 
behind these grates and so that people could hear them but not necessarily see them. And there's a lot of documentation with some of these visiting dignitaries and tours who gave glowing accounts of the performances. Some people of note were Charles Burney, Goethe, um, Quantz, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, Burney says, this afternoon I went again into the Pieta. There was not much company and the girls played a thousand tricks in the singing, particularly in the duets where there was a trial of skill and natural powers as to who could go highest and lowest or run divisions with the greatest rapidity. And French diarist Charles de Brosse says, they sing like angels and play the violin, the flute, the organ, the oboe, the cello, and the bassoon. In short, there is no instrument, however great it may be, that can daunt them. And so that last point that he makes about all the different instruments, um, they were very quick at the Pieta to adopt new instruments and they had no problem um, with the women playing all of these wind instruments. If you remember my talk from a few weeks ago, uh, women in general were not allowed to play instruments like this because it was unwomanly the way they looked when they were playing. So they typically just played the strings or harpsichord. But at the Pieta, they, uh, every instrument uh, was played and uh, and Vivaldi had an overwhelming um, amount of different instruments to work with, and, uh, and that shows in some of his compositions. So the first piece um, I'd like to talk about uh, and listen to is uh, from Opus One. This is the first piece of music that we have of Vivaldi's, and this is a collection of 12 trio sonatas. This one is in C major, so he's starting off Opus 1 with a piece in C major, and this was written for specific people, and it's hard to see, but along the left-hand side here it says Signora Prudenza on violin, Signora Pellegrina on oboe, Signora Lucietta on organ, and Signora Candida on the Shalomo. And uh, if you don't know what a Shalomo is, it's here's a picture here. It was a, a precursor to the clarinet. And um, this piece is, is representative of a lot, a lot of music that Vivaldi wrote um, because he had the freedom to experiment with all kinds of different instruments. And he wrote pieces for d different combinations of instruments than other composers were writing for. And often um, the uh, parts were um, on equal footing, like nobody was singled out to have the, the uh, melody all the time, for example. Um, and you can see this in this piece and also um, in his Concerti for Multiple Instruments is another example um, where he has different instruments and they're all given equal opportunity to play. Um, the thought is possibly that he was very sensitive to the fact that these women were um, unwanted, discarded, and and very vulnerable, vulnerable. And so he was trying to give everybody equal opportunity to play their instruments. And um, if you, uh, in going through these archives, many, many, many of the women were were acknowledged to to as players. So it wasn't like one person just got to play all the solos all the time. Everyone had a chance. So you can I play the bit about bit from movement four, and you can hear sort of the interplay between the violin and the oboe and the organ, and everybody gets a chance at it.
So that's a little bit of uh, Trio Sonata in C major from Opus 1. The next piece I wanted to talk about, uh, which was written in 1715, is the Gloria, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, this is one of Vivaldi's best known sacred works, and uh, I'm sure you would agree that it reflects his operatic skills, which he was just getting into writing operas at that time. And I think he was probably trying to share some of that with the uh, people at the Pietà. And uh, it's believed that the women sang all four parts for this piece, as, as with all the four part pieces. I'd just like to show a bit of a video here from the Vivaldi's Women Project, which was um, a project that was formed in 2006 um, based on the work of Mickey White. And they were, the choir was 18 past and present members of the Oxford Girls Choir, together with seven older women, particularly on lower parts. And they tried to reflect um, replicate Vivaldi's choir in size, age, and vocal range um, with the lowest voices down to the bottom F in the bass clef. And so this choir was kind of road testing the latest discoveries about La Pietà uh, by Mickey White and they tried to replicate the settings with the lighting and the acoustics and, and uh, put the uh, players, they place the players in the places that they would have been placed because they have documents saying where they were placed. And uh, I'll just play the first few minutes of this and you can maybe get a sense for how it sounded. Oh, by the way, this is taking place in the uh, church in Venice um, that was built, um, the second church that was built there. So maybe that gives you a bit of an idea about how things might have sounded in Vivaldi's time. Um, if you would, I just noticed in the chat here that somebody says this a video by BBC is no longer available, uh, the entire video, but if um, it is available not on YouTube, if you would like um, me to tell you where that is, just uh, send me a 
an email to info at saltspringborough.com and we can we can get you access to that. So one topic of discussion is um, how were the tenor and bass vocal parts performed at the Pieta? Um, there's various theories. The invisible man theory where they were actually men and they were um, not seen. They were just singing their parts. Um, there are no men shown in any of the drawings or paintings. Um, I guess that's because they're invisible, but uh, that's probably unlikely. There's the instrumental theory that uh, the bass and tenor parts were played by instruments. This is a possibility. We know it was done in some of the convents um, and other places. Um, so that's a possibility. There's the Chiavetti theory, which is a way of um, increasing the pitch by substituting different clefts. And that was probably unlikely. Or there's the octave transposition theory, which might have been done um, transposing the tenor and bass parts up an octave. But I think the uh, evidence suggests now, in light of the new evidence, that the vocal parts were sung, all the parts were sung by women, including the tenors and basses. Um, the names of the performers were written into the scores, and you can see, uh, as shown in those lists that I, I showed at the beginning, some of the basses and tenors names are written to the scores. So we do know that Anna Del Basso, for example, was singing bass at the Pieta, and there is references to bass singers at, in the other hospitality than Mendicanti. Um, from 1687, um, um, somebody talks about uh, Maria Anna Ziani um, being endowed naturally with a male voice, singing baritone. And uh, 1758, um, from a nobleman's diary, he talks about um, Anna Cremona and describes her as a distinguished bass singer. So I think the consensus now is that the women were singing all of the parts. This is a table put together by uh, from uh, Richard Vendome in 2020, just uh, tabulating all the singers between the years 1700 and 1745, and the different colors indicate the different voices. So you can see there were a few tenors, four, I think, for most of the years and one or two bases. So there weren't a lot of bases, but they were there and they were documented. So I think the uh, the general thought now is that uh, bases and tenors were singing those parts. Um, this is a video I'd like to show again from the Vivaldi Women's Project. This is the Gloria Patri Dixit Dominus. And uh, this is sung by three women, uh, one on bass, one on tenor, and one on alto. And I'll just play some of this. It starts out with just showing the music, and so you can listen. Um, and then it goes into showing the women singing a little bit later on.
So hopefully that gives you an idea of that it's uh, certainly possible for these pieces to be performed by all female choirs. Uh, the next piece I wanted to talk about is Nisi Dominus, Psalm 126. This is a psalm setting for solo voices. It was written for the mezzo-soprano Anna Giraud, who spent some time at La Pietà. And uh, she was uh, Vivaldi's favorite soprano, and she ended up moving in with him, living with him for quite a number of years, along with her sister. And there's all sorts of scandalous rumors about that, but uh, that's for another talk. Um, and I just, I like this piece. Um, you can sort of uh, visualize it being sung in that church setting with the great acoustics. And uh, I'll just play a little bit here. So that's a beautiful piece and that was written for the soprano Anna Giraud. So moving on now, um, the period from 1716 to 1723, he started to take on other projects and he was on and off at the Pietà at this time. He was began writing operas, he wrote a lot of operas. He said he wrote 94, I think 40 or, or 50 of them. Uh, we have evidence of at the moment. And he accepted some short-term positions funded by patrons, for example, in Mantua and Rome. But he was still employed by the Pietà and they paid him to write two concerti a month um, and he was expected to rehearse with the orchestra. Um, he wrote 140 concertos during this time, including his famous Four Seasons. And the Pietà also commissioned works for him during this time. One piece that they commissioned was Judith Triumphans, RV 644. This was commissioned by the Pietà in 1716, and it, it is the only survivor of the four oratorios that Vivaldi is known to have composed. And he wrote the soprano solos for Fili Barbara. Um, this, uh, all the 11 singing parts were performed by girls at the Pietà, both the male and the female roles. And 
the string orchestra is augmented by a number of different other instruments. Like I was saying before, he had access to all of these different players with different instruments. So he has timpani, trumpet, mandolins, theorbos, viols, uh, viola de more, recorders, chalamot, clarinets, oboes, and organ. So um, he was able to showcase uh, the range of talents of all these girls. Um, I'm just going to play uh, an area here, Veni Veni, and um, in you can hear the um, soprano Shalomo at the beginning of this, which is uh, supposed to symbolize the cooing of a turtle dove. I'll just play some of this area right now. It's a beautiful aria there, um, which was written for Fili Barbara. Now I'd like to talk about uh, the Magnificat. So we're, we're going on in time here. This was written in 1739, or this version was. And uh, we're getting uh, towards the end of Vivaldi's time at La Pieta. Um, the governors, at the, by this time, they were wanting much more virtuosic music and to allow, to, to, um, so it was much more of a spectacle and the performers could really shine. Um, and uh, so this uh, 611 is a revised version of 610 and the second movement is split into three separate solo movements which each were designed for a different um, soloist, um, Ap Apollonia, Maria la Bolognese and Chiaretta. And uh, so this movement here was written for the soprano Apollonia. And uh, I'm gonna play a little bit. You can follow along with the music. It's a very virtuosic. And um, obviously these singers knew how to sing and hopefully this uh, provided the spectacle that the governors were after.
that's a bit of the uh, solo written for soprano Apollonia, and that can't be easy. I'm not a singer, but uh, all that uh, melismatic singing with the leaps and the runs must, uh, must be quite difficult. I'll just talk a little bit now about one of the violin players, Anna Maria del Violin, and uh, she was earmarked by Vivaldi as a soloist for more than 24 of his violin concertos. And uh, in documentation, lis listeners wrote that she was one of the greatest violinists of her generation, male or female. And she rose up the ranks at the Pietà and she um, taught subsequent generations of violinists, including Chiara della Pietà and Santa della Pietà, who, who also came on, came, um, became quite famous violinists. She composed and performed publicly for the Pietà until at least age 60. And people would come from far and wide specifically to hear the orchestra with her playing. Um, she also played many other instruments, the cello, oboe, lute, mandolin, harpsichord, and viola de more. So she was quite an accomplished musician. And in the uh, library of the Benedetto Marcello Conservatory in Venice, um, a copy of, well, her actual part book exists. And this is a nicely bound book with um, all of her music in it, including all of the concertos that Vivaldi wrote for her. So I'll play a little bit now from Concerto in B-flat major. Um, you can see, well, maybe you can't, but it does say up here, Concerto for Anna, um, Anna Maria, and the con most of the concertos that he wrote for her are are have her name in them in that way. Um, this is just one of many concertos he wrote for violin. He wrote about two hundred and thirty concertos for violin, and he wrote about five hundred concertos in total, including, like I said, the thirty nine for bassoon, and I think about twenty five to thirty for cello and others for various instruments. I'll just play a little bit and you can hear some of the virtuosic violin playing. <laughs> a little bit from Vivaldi's Concerto in B-flat major for violin. Gives you an idea of the type of music that Anna Maria was playing. 
And finally, now I'd just like to mention a few of the composers that we know about who have emerged from the coro of the Ospedali, not, not strictly the Pietà, but um, all, from all four of the Ospedali. There's only five that we know of. Um, they're listed here, Vincenta da Ponte, Anna Bon, Agata della Pietà, Michelina della Pietà, and Santa della Pietà. Um, you can tell by the names of the first two, um, Ponte and Bon, that they, these were women who would have joined as um, independent, uh, they would have been the daughters of uh, wealthy noblemen who were studying at the Ospedali. At some point during Vivaldi's tenure there, they started to accept um, uh, women musicians. They would have to audition and they would get to attend there and they would pay a fee. Um, so those first two names were probably in that category. The other ones who have the name Della Pietà, no surnames, they would, uh, they would have been babies dropped off um, at the Pietà. And uh, we don't really have, I, I tried to research some of this for my talk on women composers, but we really don't know very much about these women at the moment. Um, there's a lot of research still to be done and a lot of documents left to uncover. So I'm hoping that uh, maybe somebody will find out more about them and find some more of their music. Um, there must have been mm -hmm, lots of women composing music at the Pietà because many stayed there their whole lives. And as they sort of went up the ranks, they, they get more um, detailed training in composition and theory. And so it was highly likely that they were all composing something if they stayed there their whole life. And so I'll just play a little bit of this flute sonata by Anna Baum because it's one of, she wrote a lot of flute sonatas and this is one, one that we do have access to. a little bit of the flute sonata by Anna Bond. So that's about all I had, uh, just some concluding comments. I mean, the Ospedali created a platform for women to become successful and self-sufficient um, in terms of how we look at it today, then maybe they they didn't have the best lives being, uh, um, you know, uh, sheltered there in, in the Ospedali not able to leave and, but they were at least able to play music in public, um, which other women were not able to do. And they got a good education and many of them became um, highly virtuosic at their instruments and, and singing. Um, and the musical education that occurred there undoubtedly had a significant in effect on the prominence of women in the history of music. Um, and the Ospedali supported the lives and careers of hundreds of mus musicians against all odds. They were, they were dealing with abandonment, poverty, sickness, gender stereotypes, and yet they were still to succeed. And, and a lot of the women who stayed there learned many other skills. They essentially had jobs. They were working as um, pharmacists in the medical profession, as administrators, um, and the ones who weren't musicians were were um, dealing with all the running of the organization. Um, so there probably weren't many women 
in Venice or anywhere at that time that had such responsibilities. And it's estimated that more than 4,000 original works were composed uh, for the Ospedali by at least 300 different composers. And um, I think it's highly unlikely that Vivaldi would have had such a significant output of music, especially his concertos, if he wasn't writing them um, for the women of the Pietà. And this is just a photo of the Church of the Pietà today. This church was, was finished construction about 10 years after Vivaldi died. Um, he was involved, and um, they started building it about four years after he died, and he was involved with the plans, um, and he was consulted. So um, this is where they filmed uh, Vivaldi's women uh, film, and um, probably Vivaldi had quite a bit of input, input into how it was designed. And you can go there today and listen to concerts. Um, the, uh, all of the musical activities at the Ospedali basically um, stopped around 1840 um, due to financial instability in Venice at the end of the 18th century. Um, the Derelitti closed in 1791, followed by the Medicanti 1795. And then uh, you had Napoleon's invasion of Venice in 1797. And all the musical activities at the Ospedali were reduced. The in, um, Incurabili closed in, in 1805. And uh, at that point, the Pietà was the only one left standing. Um, and their last musical composition was composed performed in 1840. So today the Pietà still has a role in looking after um, the children of troubled families and um, you can still see, um, and see and hear concerts in the church. So that's about all. Now I'll open it up for questions or comments. Well, thank you everyone for attending today's Zoom talk. I hope it was enlightening and you learned a little bit about La Pieta. And uh, we will continue on next week with the last installment of our Broke for Breakfast series. And uh, Marco will be giving his second talk on rhetoric. He'll be talking about rhetoric in the 18th century. The other talk he gave was 17th century, so there'll be a little a little bit of a difference there. And uh, hopefully you can join us for that one. In the meantime, if you'd like more information on any of the references that I talked about, um, please send me a note at info at saltspringbroke.com and I can send you more information on the various books and articles and movies that I talked about in the presentation. Otherwise, we'll hopefully see you next Saturday. Bye for now.